everybody, please welcome Deborah Hyde. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's great. You can all hear me, right? lapel mic's working. You've probably guessed from the regional speech impediment that I'm not actually from around here. <laughs> I, <laughs> I come from London. And uh, as, as the introduction said, I blog as your domain. Has anybody seen the blog at all? Anybody read it? Virgins, fantastic. <laughs> Just stick a little at in front of that, and that's my Twitter handle. So uh, it would be great if you could follow me on Twitter. Um, I edit the Skeptic magazine, and we've got those in the next room if you'd like to buy them. When, uh, when we've all finished here. Um, basically, what we're looking at today is a certain type of werewolf. It's a werewolf from the Europe of the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, there are lots of werewolves. There are all sorts of werewolf mythology throughout the world and throughout history. And we're narrowing it down to this specific one so that we can make some sense of it, because there's too much all really to do in 50 minutes. And it's an interesting kind of archetype from that time because this kind of encapsulated, it's your badass werewolf. These, these are not nice, pleasant, friendly werewolves at all. From this era, we're talking about the nasty werewolves that grab virgins, as she probably is there with that nice frock, and, um, <laughs> and ravens people and, and gets hunted. So that's what we're looking at today. Um, the, the word itself, werewolf, all of the words in all the languages are really straightforward. It's basically man, wolf. It means exactly what it says on the tin. So that doesn't necessarily give us many clues, except to say it's just it's a man, wolf cognate. And it's influenced all sorts of art. This is something from the 19th century. It's a, a penny dreadful called Wagner the werewolf. And you can see, I always say Wagner the werewolf. I didn't actually that time. but. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very difficult not to say. And there you can see him, he's, he's dashing across the front there. So explicitly we do have this person who changes into the form of a wolf. And as we'll see, uh, sometimes it can be more of a spiritual description than it is actually a physical description. Um, there's this absolutely classic comic, uh, so we can see it influences comics. This is the cover of an Alexandre Dumas book, and in this also you can see from the image on the right hand side, that is a wolf standing up talking like a person, so it's very explicitly a man-wolf. Um, anyone know this classic movie? Yay. Shout it out, which one was that? American Werewolf in London. It was fantastic, absolutely groundbreaking effects work. Brilliant movie. Does anyone know this one? Slightly more obscure, but really, really good. Yes, Mini Andalou. Uh, or Brotherhood of the Wolf. And I recommend everybody just goes out and watches this. It was absolutely superb. That was based on um, something called the Beast of Givaudan, which was a kind of cryptozoology thing of its day. The thing about The Brotherhood of the Wolf is that it's a skeptic movie. I won't spoil the ending, but you'll see in the end. It's kind of Scooby-Doo-esque in the way it treats the subject of the werewolf. And then there's this one. The movie doesn't stand up quite so well, but the effects were great. Anyone recognize this one? The Angela Carter one with um, the fairy tales. Yeah, The Company of Wolves, that's it. And uh, the effects by Christopher Tucker were absolutely stunning. So we can see that the werewolf has inspired all sorts of really classic art. And this. <laughs> if you prefer your werewolves more teddy bear-esque, as my niece does, there we go. So, so a point that Sabine Beringold made a long time ago was in the north of Europe, as we shall see, the shape of a bear, and in Africa, that of a hyena were often selected in preference. A mere matter of taste. He's making the point it doesn't have to be a wolf. These man-animal cognates happened with many animals across different cultures. So we've got this one, for example. What's this? Tiger. It's a tiger, yep. We get those in India and places where tigers naturally occur. What about that? Hyena, a hyena. They're, they're thought of as very sneaky scavenger type animals. They're actually formidable predators too. Um, the largest bite strength, the strongest bite strength in the animal kingdom, uh, terrestrial animals, formidable predators. And this? Jackal, yeah, jackal from North Africa. Um, so what is it that you can see? Is, what is the theme that's emerging about these kind of animals that we like to think that we can change into? What, what kind of things, characteristics have they got in similar, in character, you know, type? Carnivores, that's it. Carnivores, they're all top level predators. They're all the animals right at the top of the chain, which is why this idea 
is intrinsically comedic. Who wants to be a were-rabbit? Who wants to be a were-hamster? This says, put your hands down at the back. That's <laughs> This says something about the function of the werewolf in our mythology, the fact that we don't have werehamsters. Uh, one exception is, is a hare. Uh, in British folklore, uh, witches are thought to change into hares. They're also thought to change into cats, but cats are top-level predators of, of their own. They're smaller animals, but they're formidable predators. So the, the hare, there are a couple of exceptions, but in general, when we're creating mythology about man animals or woman animals, we like to change into formidable creatures. So I think what we're looking at here is the kind of Jekyll and Hyde kind of archetype, where it's almost like we're outsourcing our evil, where it's almost like we're saying, well, this thing that is happening is animalistic, it's inhuman, it's that. It isn't part of the human condition. And I think that's what we see in the, uh, in the mythology and in the stories in the 16th and 17th centuries. So what does lycanthropy actually mean? Let's start by defining our terms. Um, well, we can see lycanthropy was used as a medical condition. It actually was regarded as a kosher medical diagnosis. Uh, this was from um, a John Webster play, The Duchess of Malfi, and this was entirely just a little incidental event. Uh, it was, I'll tell you in those that are possessed with it, that is lycanthropy, this illness, um, that overflows such melancholy humor, they imagine themselves to be transformed into wolves. So there's a mechanism there, a medical mechanism for something that's going wrong. They go to churchyards in the dead of night, they dig up dead bodies, and two nights, like, um, one since met the Duke about midnight. So this is the guy they're talking about, the Duke. Uh, and he was in a, a lane behind St. Martin's Church with the leg of a man upon his shoulder, and he howled fearfully. He said he was a wolf, only the difference was that a wolf skin was hairy on the outside, and his was on the inside. He bade them take their swords, rip up his flesh, and try, that is, try to see whether his flesh was hairy on the inside. Straight I was sent for, this is the doctor speaking, and having ministered to him, found his grace very well recovered. So, to a modern audience, uh, there, that is a real WTF moment. I mean, <laughs> pardon? And yet this, this turns up in the narrative as though it's like, oh yeah, yeah, this stuff happens. So there are clearly things that were going on in the minds of people at the time that we're not aware of. And, and the origins for this at the time are actually fairly easy to track down. This is The Anatomy of Melancholy by Robert Burton, which was a psychiatric textbook of its day. And he defines this condition, lycanthropia, or wolf madness, uh, when men run howling around in graves and fields at night and will not be persuaded that they are not wolves or some such beasts. Um, I should refer to it as madness, as most men do. They lie hid most part all day and go abroad in the night, barking, howling at graves and deserts. And uh, they have, not deserts, that's different. They have unusually hollow eyes, scabbed legs, and thighs. They're very dry and pale. So he's describing what he has classified as a medical condition. It's some kind of some kind of transient psychotic episode, and he's written it down, and it's called lycanthropy. It wasn't a totally uncontroversial medical diagnosis. Some people believed in it, some people didn't. But nonetheless, it was, it was something that was regarded as treatable. Um, Simon Goulard, who was uh, also a doctor, he was a French doctor who um, operated in Switzerland a lot, uh, also tells another story of a melancholy lycanthrope who knew him well. Um, was, the guy was troubled with his disease. He was in the middle of his psychotic episode. He passed him on the street, uh, and he was followed by a troop of people. He carried upon his shoulders the whole leg and thigh of a dead man. Um, and he looked at Simon Goulart, uh, and Simon Goulart was a bit nervous of looking back. Um, but the guy later on said to him that, uh, you know, why were you afraid? Um, and that, that made Goulart think, what made me think that his memory was hurt, was not hurt nor impaired. So in other words, the guy was in an altered state, cognitively, but his memory was intact. Now, we have that with the, uh, the Duke from John Webster's play, with him going down the road and he's got the corpse of a dead man over his shoulder. So this was actually something, it was, it was being reported it, from an anecdote at the time, it really did happen. This one is a very sad case of a countryman in Pavia who um, also had a transient psychotic episode. He unfortunately killed some people. And he said, I am, I am a wolf on the inside. The Latin term is verisipilis. It means your skin is basically turned on the other way around. Only instead of taking him to the doctor, they actually thought, OK, let's have a look. And they slashed him. Um, unfortunately, he suffered from such grave injuries that he died. So again, we have a non-fictional account of that thing that turns up 
in the play. So th this is kind of a fairly comprehensive picture that it was regarded as a medical condition. Um, this f is from the dialogical, the dialogical discourses of spirits and devils. And you can see that it's categorized disordered melancholy from mania, from epilepsy, from lunacy, which is of course um, a, a term for madness, from lycanthropy, convulsions, from the mother. That's a kind of uh, hysteria that you get when you've got a uterus. Um, <laughs> from the menstrual obstructions. So again, it, you can see that lycanthropy is listed uh, along a load of other perfectly normal sort of medical abnormalities like epilepsy, depression, and being female. <laughs> so this is from Lewis Cranach, and you see here, this is your classic werewolf who, who is mad. He's, he's explicitly in the form of a man. He's not in the form of a wolf at all. He's on all fours, like a wolf. He's taking a baby away. So he is perpetrating, but he is, in all probability, just suffering from a temporary psychotic episode. Now, psychopaths, as lycanthrope, are the second kind of category that we're going to go through. Um, and again, this is where somebody, where people didn't believe that there was a transformation into a wolf. They were simply using the term, they were outsourcing the evil, as we saw with the Jekyll and Hyde thing. And where somebody did something so inexplicable, so awful, and they didn't even have the excuse of madness. And people would say, that's lycanthropy, they were werewolves because they were so cruel and unpleasant. Uh, one kind of, um, case of this is the werewolf of Chalon from the Parliament of Paris. And um, a cask of bones was found in his shop. He was a tailor. And to, to all outward appearances, I mean, he conducted a business. He seemed absolutely fine. And it wasn't until they found this cask of bones that they realized something was amiss. The cask of bones actually turned out to um, be the bones of children. So he had been perpetrating for many years. He was what we would, he, we would recognize now as a serial killer. And unfortunately, the judges were so horrified that they ordered the trial records burned, which is an um, understandable act of revulsion from their point of view. But for us, it's sad because it would be nice to know a few more of the details. But there are a few examples of these where they say lycanthropy, werewolfism, and it's clearly just somebody doing something highly, highly antisocial. Now, the third category, and this is the biggest one we're going to go into today, is to look at lycanthropy in the form of witchcraft. And we'll go through a few cases of people being tried as werewolves and witches the two were conflated, just so that we can actually see, we can try and work out what the real story was behind this. Um, you can see here, these are a few of, of the ones that I've been able to dig up, examples of witch trials where there was lycanthropy involved. There's quite a few of them, a lot of them in France. Um, and the witch hunts of the 16th and 17th century, it's worth starting basically by saying, was this caused, to use the lingo, um, from the bottom up? Was this... <laughs> Where does that picture come from? <laughs> of course. And do you remember what the uniform of the lower classes was in that film? Dirt. Covered in shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I can tell he's a prince. He isn't covered in shit. So, um, so yes, was this just a load of ignorant peasants uh, who believed in supernatural things and who were indulging their own worst sort of superstitious beliefs, and therefore they caused loads and loads of witch hunts. Was, was it that case? Or was it top down? Who recognizes him? Any Blackadder fans? Oh, yeah, yeah, go on. <laughs> he was, his name was Lord Melchett. Lord Melchett. Um, and it was the right era, too, because it was the Tudor era. He's wearing his lovely Tudor clothes, which always looked very impractical to me. And uh, so was it the ruling classes who kind of intellectualized the idea and then perpetrated the idea and s facilitated witch hunts? Well, in, in fact, there's, there's kind of evidence of a bit of both. But really, um, people, most people, unless there is some major intervention, like kind of even comfortable living and a lot of education, will believe in the supernatural. It's kind of the default um, setting for human beings. So the fact that the peasantry believed in this stuff actually isn't all that exceptional in history. The fact when there is a witch hunt, when there is a specific gathering and organized witch hunt, it's usually a sign of something else entirely. And with this, there really was a lot of top-down activity. 
in the history at the time, the Inquisition had been set up in response to heresy, to cathars and that kind of thing um, a bit earlier. And I had a very wise friend once said, when you've got a hammer, everything sure starts to look like a nail. The Inquisition had their heresy hammer. It was their job. So as soon as they ran out of heretics, they needed to invent new ones. And in fact, the, the Inquisition did go through several phases. They needed to continue justifying their, uh, their actual existence. And they did turn to witch hunts. It was mostly promulgated by Dominican uh, friars, which were the people that, um, that, that were the, the inquisitors. So we can see this really with a, a group of people, a professional body of people looking for a mission. There's the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. It's absolutely unavoidable that at this point in history that Catholics and Protestants were fighting for the spiritual and political and financial dominions of Europe. It was a very, very key time in history. It's, it was reckoned to be roughly 150 years in, in the acute phase, but of course the, the, the consequences are still going on now. So if we count it from sort of 1517 to 1648 or so, this was a very, very turbulent time in European history. This wasn't a matter of people freely um, just deciding what they believed in. There were, whole, there were the fates of nations depended on the, uh, on the religious affiliation of the rulers. So it was a very, very serious business. You can see on the map at the left-hand side, Europe started as, well, Western Europe started as Catholic. In the middle, there were great gains made by Protestants. The gains were a little bit lost, and so you have a bit more of a patchwork quilt left at the end of it. And you've got the post-Renaissance phase. It was the birth pangs of, of modernity. And Gutenberg's printing press in the 1440s eventually made a great deal of difference to all of our lives, including today. But bear in mind that you can print science books, and you can also print a load of wretched witch hunting manuals, and they certainly did. This was one of the first ones that came out. It was, it was I would say the second, there was uh, one called Formicarius, which was tremendously influential and had happened a few years beforehand. But this is the one that is remembered. Does anyone recognize this one, the Malleus Maleficarum? You load of godless heathen satanic. <laughs> yeah, very, 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 very influential and um, written by Dominicans. And these are just a few of the others. There were a lot of them. Uh, if you wanted to write an anti-witch hunting manual, as both uh, Johann Weir and Reginald Scott did, you could do it. It's just that you needed the sponsorship of a very, very powerful and influential sponsor. You know, um, Weir was protected by the Duke of Cleves, for example. So there was a rationalist backlash at the time. There was, and lots of people must have been disgusted by what was going on. But you take your life in your hands when you go against the authorities who are killing people for heresy. And witchcraft is very, very much connected with heresy. So I made this little map of, um, of werewolf trials that I could find in France. And can you notice sort of like a general, a general pattern? It's not true in every single case, but something of a characteristic of, of all of these. There's a, there's, a little, there's a little sort of gathering up there, isn't there? Harsh climate, you're kind of, yeah, you're on, you're on the right kind of a thing there. Look at the climate, look at the terrain. It's mountains, yes, isolated and it's mountains. So what you have is that the Inquisition would tend to go into these isolated valleys and it would be somewhere where um, you, would, you probably would have religious independence. They could get away with it. They lived up a mountain who was there to correct them. But also, you had somewhere where there were actual wolves as natural biological creatures around. And what people tend to appropriate the symbolism around them. Um, they, they don't make up stuff completely from absolutely nowhere. They use the symbols in the environment, and those symbols get appropriated and sometimes misused. And in fact, has anyone here ever heard of sleep paralysis? You know what sleep paralysis is? Educated audience, that's excellent. And you know that sleep paralysis has been blamed on all sorts of things, including the latest incarnation is it's thought to be responsible possibly for UFO abductee. Stories. So here we have, for example, the Pixies berating this man. He's saying, for goodness sake, man, snap out of it. We're not aliens from outer space. We're Pixies, Pixies from your garden. Is that so difficult to understand? <laughs> so this poor man, he's lying on his back, as sleep paralysis victims do, and he's just woken up, and he's attributed his dreadful experience to the, uh, to the UFOs and to the aliens. And the Pixies are pissed off, under understandably. 
not getting the credit for their job. So we see, we see this time and time again with mythology. People take the symbols that they have in their environment and they use them and they apply them. So it's not surprising that wolves turn up as symbols in mountainous regions. Now, the first case we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about three, because they'll give us a chance to look at the different types of werewolf trials that you could get, were the werewolves of Poligny. And um, they were tried by the Inquisitor General of um, Besançon. And this was, this was written down well after the fact. The, the account was written down about 70 years later, which is not good for us um, as skeptics, it would be nice to have some original records, but this is as close as we get. So there were these three fellas. Now, the themes that we have was that it was a Dominican friar. It was the Inquisition. So we're talking really, we're starting from a heresy point of view. Um, they were tortured. So how much use do you think their confessions were? This, this didn't seem to occur to people. They accepted torture. Uh, under, you, you know, the, the confessions gained under torture. It was absolutely useless. So that's got to really, um, that, that's got to affect the way that we look at this story. Uh, the theme was that they had a magic salve so that they could turn into wolves. Now, unlike the two cases we've discussed before, the, the psychopathy and the medical condition, we are talking here about somebody explicitly, for the first time, changing into a wolf. It looks like they change into a wolf. They put a magic salve on that they get from Satan, and they turn into a wolf so that they can go off to do the sabbats and raising the hail and do all the antisocial things that they do. Uh, and there's the story of sympathetic wounding. This is a very big theme that turns up again and again and again with werewolf lore. Uh, a traveler was out traveling <coughs> in the forest and he's attacked by a great unnatural wolf. He manages to stab the wolf, very luckily. He tracks the wolf down to its lair, but it turns out not to be a lair, it turns out to be a house, and he finds uh, a man having his wounds bathed by his wife, and the wound on the man corresponds to the wound that the traveler gave to the wolf. So that's sympathetic wounding. And it's, it's a big theme. It's very pleasing, actually, from, from a story point of view. It turns up in fiction again and again. Um, and, and we, we can see it again and again, we see it here. I think it was uh, Michel Verdun who was the man who was wounded. So the second one is Gilles Garnier. This was in uh, Dole, Franche Comte, and this was more of a direct account, which is better for us as skeptics. We're not just getting uh, the kind of Reader's Digest version at the end. We're, we're getting something closer to the, the records at the time. Now, unlike the werewolves of Poligny, we know something was going on in the district because there was a proclamation from the local parliament and they gave, they gave people permission to go out and shoot whatever it was that was going around taking the sheep and the children and all that kind of thing. So there was some kind of agent in the environment that was being antisocial, whether or not that was a person or whether or not it was a rogue wolf or a pack of wolves, um, who knows. But we, at, least, at least they were searching for something. They knew they were looking for something. But you, you also know under those circumstances that people tend to get a little bit hysterical. They will tend to find something something, focus on it, just grab it, and then blame it. Well, this is what they did with Gilles Garnier. Um, there was, uh, uh, basically, it was a little girl was attacked, and they ran up to help her, and they said that the, the a wolf that was attacking her was a wolf in whom they recognized Garnier's features. So again, we explicitly have a wolf that looks like a bloke. Uh, and that was the end of it for Garnier. It was a wolf that looked a bit like Gilles Garnier. So they, they went off and they got him. Now, can a man actually change shape? Um, the number of, <laughs> the amount of ink that's been spent on this is, is absolutely dazzling. Uh, the, I mean, you, you, the Reader's Digest version from the Compendium Maleficarum, it says, the devil deceives our senses in various ways. Sometimes he substitutes another body while the witches themselves are absent or hidden apart in some secret place. Sometimes he assumes the body of a wolf from the air and wrapped about him and does those actions which men think are done by the wretched absent witch who is asleep. So in that case, he puts the witch to sleep, the, the devil goes out and does it, and then um, or, or there is another method which is that he surrounds the witch with an aerial effigy of a beast. So the, the witch goes out and does it, but by glamour, she appears to look as though she is a wolf. Um, but this only happens when they use certain ointments and words. So it really is the witch, not the devil, who is culpable because she can only cause this to happen by having a contract with Satan. This doesn't happen to innocent people. This is witchcraft. People are culpable for it. It is a sin and it is an antisocial act. 
So the thing about Gilles Garnier, which is interesting for us to, to see, is that he was an outsider from Lyon. So within this community where we know that they were suffering from some loss of, of livestock or loss of children, that they just fixed upon this bloke and that he wasn't one of their own. Also, his personal manner was apparently not very nice. And you see this again and again in witchcraft trials, that it quite often turns up that somebody, uh, they end up getting the person they've been dying to get for 20 years. Uh, this certainly is the case with Gilles Garnier. He was poor. And the point about the economies at this time were that um, people who weren't poor actually weren't all that rich either. They, they kind of lived more or less hand to mouth. And it was your Christian duty to look after people if they came to your door and they asked for some help. Um, but if you really only had one more day's food in the larder, those people were a pain in the ass. And uh, so you, you quite often see this. It's a method, really, of kind of cleansing your, your village of the poorest people, the people who keep asking you for stuff. The number of times in a witch trial where you see somebody who really should have committed an act of charity to somebody, but they didn't do it, and then they accuse that person of being a witch is absolutely too dazzling and, and turns up too often to be completely irrelevant. Now, the third one we're going to look at is Peter Stubb. Um, in 1589, the case of Peter Stubb, this is moving up towards Germany. They said, the devil gave unto him a girdle, which being put about him, he was straight transformed into the likeness of a greedy, devouring wolf. So again, explicitly changing into a wolf. There's no metaphors here. Um, strong and mighty, with eyes great and large, which in the night sparkled under brands of fire. A mouth great and wide, with sharp and cruel teeth. A huge body and mighty paws. The whole province was feared by the cruelty of this bloody and devouring wolf. Now, what we know about Peter Stubb is unfortunately from one pamphlet. It would be nice, um, as with, in the case of Gilles Garnier, if we had some kind of documentation leading up to finding Stubb the werewolf, to finding out what he'd been doing. If, as this document says, he had been causing havoc in the environment for 25 years prior to him being discovered, then really, as skeptics, it would be nice for us to be able to see that paper trail to know that something was happening in, in the environment. There is no such thing. It's, it's kind of, this isn't a Gilles Garnier case, this is more of a fait accompli, and that should put us um, on alert, really. Uh, it's vouched for in the court records and memorized in the pictures carved in brass, which are for sale. So if anyone ever tells you that um, torture porn is a recent thing, uh, <laughs> You know, these, these were, this was recreational pictures, it was recreational killing, and it was really done. This, this wasn't special effects. So um, I, I don't think we should worry about our moral decline via Hollywood too much. Now, he was accused of incest with his daughter, sister, and a succubus, and this was centuries before Viagra. So Peter Stubb was a hell of a guy. Um, and he was, a, he was a pantomime villain. I mean, the thing that strikes me more than anything else about, about this case, for never was a, known, uh, a, wit, a wretch from uh, nature so far degenerate. I mean, you know, they can't heap enough opprobrium on him. He, they, they're really, really going for it to try and paint him black, black, black. And that, that's got to mean something. Um, he was explicitly in the likeness of a wolf, and he was hunted with the aid of dogs. This was how they finally got him. Um, he slipped the belt. He didn't have magic salve. He had a special belt from Satan. And, uh, and then he changed back into a man. Now, the book says he was threatened with torture but confessed. I've got to say that their terms back then for being threatened with torture were kind of a little bit looser than ours. I think probably some actually did happen. Um, and also, if, uh, you know, if I was shown the instruments of torture, I would confess to anything, too. They were, it was really, really horrible. So the fact that there was a confession, to my mind, when there's torture in the mix, doesn't actually mean anything. Um, he cast the belt off in a certain valley. Uh, they went to the valley to look for it, but found nothing at all. And it was supposed that it was gone to the devil from whence it came. And... Uh, you know how conspiracy theorists, you know how like one set of facts confirm to them that their conspiracy theory is true, and then the complete absence of that set of facts confirm to them that their theory is absolutely true. Um, it makes you wonder what on earth Peter Stubb would have to have done in order to persuade them that there was no frigging belt. 
So the fact that they couldn't find it, uh, if they'd have found it, whatever it was, he was damned. They had made up their mind in advance. So these people, they, they said his nature being inclined to blood and cruelty. This is casting some aspersions here. So um, these civilised people, by comparison, uh, decided to have his body laid on a wheel and with red hot uh, burning pincers in several places to have the flesh pulled off from the bones. His legs and arms to be broken with wooden axe or hatchet afterwards to have his head struck from his body. Now, I read a lot about Reformation torture and um, the practices in relation to witches. This is extreme. They were really, really going for him. Uh, and there is your poster for your bedroom wall, the, uh, the bit of 17th century torture porn. Uh, they're pulling his nipples off at one point there. It's just, um, absolutely bizarre and it, very, very unpleasant. So he suffered death accordingly in the town of Bedburg in the presence of many peers and princes of Germany. What? How many peers and princes do you think turn up for your average witch trial? That should give us a clue. Um, in fact, if we look at that map, if we go back to the map that we looked at earlier, you can see Bedba is the little red dot there in the middle. Can everybody see that? Yep. And then over here, so you see originally it was Catholic, then it went to Protestantism, then it went to Catholic. And in fact, with the timings of the dates and the fact that he's turned into such a pantomime villain and the fact that he is murdered in such an appalling way suggests very strongly to me that he was actually, it was a political murder that he was being made a scapegoat of. And at this era, the whole point about witchcraft was that it was essentially a charge connected with heresy. We're not talking about potty old women boiling up nettles to stop period pains or anything like that. Um, we're talking about people who uh, who really are accused of, of being Catholic in a Protestant environment or being Protestant in a Catholic environment. You see that again and again and again. So this is the top-down thing. This is the, the sort of the political environment um, creating these witch hunts. And I think there's every reason to believe that Peter Stubb may have been a political murder. So my conclusions from having studied werewolves in the 16th and 17th century is watch during times of social and economic upheaval for scapegoating behavior. Uh, and I think that applies to our own era very much because um, we are, we're kind of poor at the moment and we're going to get poorer and, you know, j just wait for it. It happens. Even in the context of non-religious environments, uh, finding a scapegoat is tremendously satisfying. You can go through a ritual, you can do whatever you like, and for a while you actually feel better as a community. So scapegoating behavior needs to be really, really carefully looked at. Uh, especially that directed towards the vulnerable. It's, it's kind of a way of actually purging your community of anybody you actually have to give something to. Um, and that is definitely a theme with witch trials. Beware of the educated and influential talking bollocks. <laughs> I love the word bollocks. <laughs> and, <laughs> I know, I know it, doesn't, it doesn't emerge quite so well from an American mouth, but I think that you should all practice saying it and use it wherever possible. It is, is my gift to you as an English person. <laughs> Do use the word bollocks because it's wonderful. Um, and the other thing that I would emphasize, especially since we've gone through this kind of neo-pagan um, era where uh, you know, people, people think they're witches because they dance naked around oak trees and stuff like that. Um, the, the, there is the theory that witchcraft was a separate strand of, of religion and that uh, this was basically a way of, of, uh, of the orthodoxy crushing people who are trying to practice their own religion. There really is like that much evidence for this. Witchcraft in the sense of that um, reformation uh, witch trials, it was something, it was a way of defining the other in relation to the norm. So it was, it was essentially a charge to do with somebody being antisocial. It was a term of abuse. Um, so these days, you know, whatever people want to do, that's fine. Uh, but don't believe that there's, there's some kind of, you know, prehistoric uh, European religion that, that managed to la last through all of that and that just emerged in the 1920s. Um, they say that Wiccan is Old English for basket case. Um, I <laughs> every Wiccan I've ever met turns out to be really nice, so that's, that's, that's fine. Uh, so, that, so this really is how we end up, I think, with our modern idea of what a werewolf is. There's Red, Red Riding Hood and the wolf um, pretending to be her grandma. So, 
that, that was collected by Charles Perrault and the, and the Grimm's um, sort of after the Reformation. And, and so during that time in history, it really is responsible for the way that we see the werewolf and to a degree how we see the wolf these days. Uh, when I started studying all of this and I started doing all of the werewolf stuff, I thought, first thing I'm going to do is go meet some wolves. So as a result of this whole process, I'm able to introduce to you um, quite a good friend of mine now. Oh, her name's Kea. And, uh, and she's very, very pretty. And I, they, they let me come up and see her. She's a socialized wolf. She's never going to be um, reintroduced into the wild. She was born, uh, she was, you know, sort of born socialized and born with people. They never become tame. They're not suitable as pets at all. Um, that, that's sort of, sort of massive macho dickery to try and move them into a domestic environment. They, they don't belong there. But they, do be, they can become socialized. They can like people. And she certainly does. She earns her keep. The first time that I saw her, um, her, her owner, friend person, came out with a great big lead. And so Kaya was walking towards me. And if you have never encountered, who's met a wolf or seen a wolf close? Excellent. Excellent. And the thing about them is um, they're, they're the proportions of a German shepherd. And, you, you know, they come, they come towards you, and I'm thinking, oh, well, there's a German shepherd. But then they just keep coming. <laughs> and uh, they, they are larger than domestic dogs, and their paws are enormous, their I mean, teeth are enormous. And so I leant down so that she could get the smell of me, so that she could just get the essence of me totally underestimated how large she was, and she just leant up and licked me on my face. So, <laughs> so it's just as well. She's friendly. Um, <laughs> yes. So, so I think really what I would like to conclude with is, is the fact that our idea of what wolves are has been very, very much affected by this mythology. And... Um, they're not domesticated, and, and of course they are dangerous, they're formidable predators, but they're very social and they're not stupid. They will only go for people under the most intense provocation or when, or when they're really starving. So in general, they tend to stay away from people. They're a bit of a problem with livestock, uh, but there are still kind of organic ways of dealing with that. They are not the demonic animals that we have created uh, in our minds. Um, this is the guy that Kaya lives with, that's, um, uh, that's Peto, and he likes getting his bottom scratched. <laughs> and he doesn't like men much, and when you hear him growl, that's actually quite something. But he doesn't growl at the ladies, so that's okay by, for me. And, um, and this is the whole family. So I think really, what, if I could send you away with any message today, it would be that I've always been fascinated with the malign supernatural. Um, I usually get a good hearing at skeptic conventions because everybody's going, oh, yeah, well, you know, hey, people have believed in angels and gods. Why not werewolves and vampires too? And I think it's very, very much the whole subject is fascinating. We get the dark friss on. It's fantastic for entertainment. But studying this stuff helps us to understand ourselves more than anything else. It's all about us. So there aren't any werewolves but there is the dark side of human nature, and that's worth studying. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>